All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Paul Halmy, who went from working as a stockbroker for a major Wall Street firm to being an entrepreneur. Now, he specializes in helping entrepreneurs fix their finances and then buy assets to create passive income. Paul, how you doing? Man, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. Thanks for coming on. And we like to jump right in. So if you could start with telling us a little bit more about yourself and what you like to do for fun, that'd be great. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I grew up in a small Midwest town in South Dakota and then made the journey down to Texas. And then one thing led to another and got hooked on jujitsu because my best friend at the time wanted to be a UFC fighter. And this is back when the UFC was like super tiny. Um, and then jujitsu kind of led into all these different aspects of my life where I ended up meeting some guys at the gym that were stockbrokers. I'm like, hey, I want to do that. And then did that for a while. And then my friends that were entrepreneurs, I'm like, that looks even cooler because you guys have a, a way you know, more controlled lifestyle. I have to, you know, clock in, clock out, be strapped mm -hmm. to my desk and then made that jump in entrepreneurship. And then, you know, jujitsu led to all that. So I'm, that's my favorite thing in the world is doing jujitsu. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So jujitsu led to stockbroker, which led to <laughs> entrepreneurship. Yep. I it's love crazy. it. And so when you talk about specializing in helping entrepreneurs fix their finances and buy assets to create passive income, are you more of a consultant? Are you like, what's exactly your role? Yeah, definitely. Definitely not a financial advisor anymore. Don't have my licenses, none of that stuff. So I just do consulting. So a lot of times we don't even get into investments until later on down the road because most entrepreneurs, when I talk to them, they're like, oh yeah, my best investment is my business. I keep putting money back in. I'm like, yeah, that's great. But what's going to happen? We have the next recession, but we had worse than that. In 2020, we had the pandemic, which was like, hey, you're not even in a recession. You literally can't run your business. Yeah. You know. So they learned the hard way of like, I really have to have money outside of my business. So a lot of times we'll go through and I'll consult with them be like, Hey, you know, you're doing good. Yes. Keep reinvesting the business, but you got to start taking money out of the business. Talk to your CPA about doing distributions, what you can do, but you have to do something because you know, when the recessions hit or God, we'll never go through another pandemic again, but something like that, man, if you don't have other things outside of your business, it's scary. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so does it tend to be a consulting fee, a like, piece of profit that they gain like how does that work yeah a lot of times we'll do it as a consulting fee um and just to, like have a set thing and then for the people who are like oh hey i don't want to do that then we have courses where like here this is how you you know go through these different phases ah, I see. so yeah so we do it a lot of people will do the course mode and then they'll get people like hey you know what i want one-on-one -on -one, you know mentorship help me out with this and then yeah we'll go through and do that but yeah never like you know i want them to make as much money as they can and, and keep scaling it up so that doesn't affect anything for us yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. Nice. Nice. Well, tell us a bit more about your motivation. What really gets you up and keeps you going every day, man, just trying to live the dream. It's like, you know, it's yeah. like, it's just, you get so lucky. I, I go back to it. It's like, you just keep taking action and you, and you get luckier. It's like, you know, life has been amazing. And so I get up, you know, I'm just lucky and blessed where it's like, I get up and it's like, I'm excited. It's like, Oh, cool. The day here, I'm going to do a little bit of work. Then I'm gonna go do some jujitsu. And then I'm going to, you know, go to the gym tonight with my wife and my daughter. And then we're gonna do this and that have dinner. And what really motivates me is having control of what I do day to day, how I get to do it. And then at the same time, I'm always trying to build things. So it's like, you know, first it was building business, then it was building companies. Now I'm like, okay, I'm in this next evolution of life where it's like, I'm getting older. My kids are older now, you know, they're uh, 18 and 20. So it's like, okay, this is going to be the next phase of life. What do we do now? I'm like, I guess we start buying stuff and we start, you know, buying into like other assets, not like buying like, you know, things where you're just wasting money, but trying to buy things that create income. So it's like, Hey, you know what, when, you know, we have grandkids or whatever, someday we want to do stuff and we don't want to do anything. It's like, you know, I'm, maybe my kids move somewhere else and I want to go stay there for two months. I want to be able to do that. So that's what drives me is creating this lifestyle by design, you know, where it's like, I can do the things I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. I, um, realized from a very young age that I didn't like being shooed in to a specific <laughs> thing or like forced into it. And so I really loved options. And so I became a high performer when it came to school and when it came to football, because I was like, this is what's going to give me the most options right now. And I found that entrepreneurship is the thing that gives you the most options as an adult. And sometimes it can be a bumpy ride. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. There's bumps, there's bumps, <laughs> <laughs> but it's definitely worth it. Definitely worth it. Well, awesome, man. Let's jump into your dreams and goals. I feel like we got to hear a little bit about them, but what's your vision for your life and your company? Man, so the vision for this one, my ultimate goal is to help keep 
help people create, you know, income where they can do the things they want to do and just enjoy life, not be, like I said, chained in and locked into place. So for me, I get driven by seeing my clients get results. They're growing their business. I'm growing my business. They're growing their finances. I'm growing my finances. And then what I really love to do is pair that with travel and then go do cool events. Like we're going to Thailand uh, next week with a bunch of guys that own businesses and basically doing like a consulting trip and sightseeing and go to, you know, the, watch, go to a bunch of, watch a bunch of fights and just have a really good time. So yeah. I really like being able to interact with clients and go do fun stuff. That's like my passion is travel. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Sounds like a little bit of a, like a mastermind event. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. It's like, a, you know, go mastermind. Then I make it fun. We'll go train. We'll go work out. We'll do, you know, active things. So it's a good time. I got you. I got you. So are the clients you work with, do they usually also do jujitsu? In the beginning? Yes. It was all that, you know, now it's kind of evolving. So I was kind of pigeoned into like, Hey, this guy helps gym owners. And I'm like, well, yeah, I do. But then other entrepreneurs were like, Hey, can you help me? I'm like, yeah, it's, it's just numbers. It's just, let's look at your profit and loss statement. Let's look at this. Okay. We can do this. So and more and more people have been opened up like, okay, he's not just a jujitsu guy. He's actually, cause we get kind of a bad rap of we're Neanderthals, you know, and they're like, Hey, this guy's actually semi-intelligent and he can help out. So in the last year, it's been a lot more, um, and it's been fun of uh, people in other industries that I've been working with. So it's been cool to see that, you know, it works for any industry. Gotcha. So what does it typically look like when you consult somebody? Is it like, Hey, cut down on spending here and start taking a distribution to invest? Or does it look like, like, are you, helping them create more cash flow or just rearrange their numbers to a little optimize. bit of bias. Yeah. The first one, believe it or not, is kind of the scary one is getting them to look at their numbers. Like hmm. a lot of entrepreneurs are like, Oh man, you know, everything's fine. You know, I'm running it through the checking, da, 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 da. you know, it's like, okay, but what are your numbers? And they're like, uh, it's okay. And I'm like, no, it's black and white. I want to see it. You know, this, this is where we're going to pull the bandaid off. It's going to sting a little bit. And you're going to be like, Oh my God, I'm spending this on this. And it's like, yeah, why are you doing that? I don't know. And like, you know, I'll see people like an example, like, I don't like to be like, oh, you can't have Starbucks or, oh, you can't do that. Like a lot of people say, I'm like, let's look at it. Like, why do you have click funnels and another software? Like, why do you have two of the same software? I don't know. I didn't cancel one. I'm like, cool, cancel that. That's 300 bucks a month. Okay, let's move that. Now we're going to make that new distribution. They're like, oh, that's cool. You know, so it's like yeah. you find things because I'm guilty of it too. Sometimes I'll look at my credit card. And I'm like, I thought I canceled that. And it's like, you know, 17 bucks a month, but it's been running for two years. Uh huh. So I like people to have fun still. It's like, yeah, go have Starbucks, have fun. Like, but, but the things that you don't need, yeah, cut that out and then convert that into a distribution and then start building things up outside of your business. That's yeah. what we see. And then of course, like, yeah, if they're like, Hey, you know, we'll look at their numbers. Like, okay. You know, a typical business that I deal with is like, okay, you look at their lead flow. Okay. How many leads are you getting? How many appointments are you setting? How many appointments are showing? And how many are, are you closing in, into, a, into a client? And then we can look at the numbers and be like, okay, <clears throat> usually out of those four numbers, one number is going to be off. Like something like it's glaringly obvious. Like, okay, your appointment, whoever setting your appointment sucks or your, your whoever signing people up sucks yeah. or your lead flow is horrible. And then you, you tweak it. And then they're like, oh man, we tweaked this one, but you it tweaked the one number and it fixes the other three. So it's, mm -hmm. It's fun to do. So yeah, we, we hit, we go from both angles. Like I'll try to help them like, Hey, this is how you're going to increase, you know, the money you make. And then also here, let's try to ways, find ways to trim some stuff off the budget too. I love it. I love it. And when you're helping entrepreneurs, I feel like in those four process, in those four steps, a lot of entrepreneurs are stuck at lead flow. Are you working with entrepreneurs that are more stuck at lead flow or more entrepreneurs who are stuck on the closing appointment setting side? A little bit of both. Yeah. Those are the two biggest ones. Yeah, so we'll, yeah, we'll go through both because it's kind of funny. I mean, because I've been you know up in my gym in 2003, so it's I've been in the woods for the you know and digging and working and all this stuff. So a lot yeah, I went through is a lot of digital marketing and learning how to create leads and okay, cool, we're good at that. Now we got to get good at closing. So I'm able to kind of look at it and from the numbers, I can tell them what's wrong and then we can fix it. Hmm. Yeah, I got you. Do you find <laughs> that lead flow is typically a is it more of a copy issue or is it more of a how much money they're putting into ads issue? Bit of both. It's a bit of both. And then the scary part is when people are like, oh, ads don't work or Facebook doesn't work. Or I'm like, how does it not work? It's like, it's the biggest thing on earth. It, yeah. It's like, you're putting your, and people, and it's funny, like we'll get clients they are like, you know, they're like, oh, I'm not getting as many leads as I thought. And my leads are expensive and yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, all right, cool. And then if you follow like Frank Kern, I'm sure you've heard of him. It's like, he calls it like redneck analytics. He's like, well, did you make more money this month? Yeah, yeah. Sales are up 18%. Okay. What did you do different? Well, I started running ads. You're like, oh, maybe that had something to do with it. And it keeps, <laughs> and it's funny because people will be like, 
the, I still do with it. Like I had a message from a, a client today. He's like, Oh, we're going to turn off our ads, you know, cause they're too expensive. I'm like, so that's your solution is to not run ads. And what are you going to like put smoke signals out front of your gym and get like a spinny sign, yep. you know, and they don't get it. And you look at it and you're like, okay, before you start working with us, you were getting, you know, this amount of leads. Now you're getting 25% more. Okay. You're going to turn it off. Okay, cool. Good. Good luck with that. Yeah. You know, like it, it gets frustrating because they don't look at it. Like you're getting more people in. And there was a crazy article. I, I don't have it on my computer, but pulled up. But it was like, they said, Google's seeing a bigger, people are seeing a higher thing where people not only are not opting in a lot to the website, they're not even clicking. It's like, cause Google's now giving such good responses. Like when you Google something, you can get all the stuff on Google without having to leave Google. Yep. So they're seeing like a, a huge drop in the amount of clicks. And I'm like, and I try to explain it to clients. I'm like, yes, you might, you're not getting the same amount of leads you were getting a few years ago. Cause I'm that way. Like if I want something, I don't usually opt in anymore. Cause I'm like, I get so many emails. I'm like, so like when, I, when Lifetime Fitness opened up down the street, you know, they had a thing like, oh, opt in for this thing. I'm like, nah, I'm just going to go up there. You know, it's yeah. like, and I, but like, they have no way of tracking me. I never opted in. I didn't do anything. And I went and joined because I saw them on Facebook, you mm -hmm. know? So it's like, people have to, you, as a business, you have to be out in front of people and you don't have to spend a lot of money either. You can do a lot of awareness marketing, things like that, just to get the lead flow up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I think that is so important. Um, it's one of the things that like continues to kind of, kick me in the side in my entrepreneurial journey. But I guess in my position, it's like, what do you say? So it sounds like you're working with entrepreneurs that like have the cash flow to distribute yep. towards marketing. When you are an entrepreneur starting from zero, what do you suggest on the marketing side? More of the organic strategies, taking out oh, debt yeah. to market. What do you? Yeah, we call it sweat equity. So we tell people like, and we'll tell them that like, if they come on board and they're like, Hey, like I'm a new gym owner or I'm a new, you know, I, I got this new um chiropractic office. And they're like, I don't want to spend a lot of money on ads. I'm like, well, that's cool because ads are great when you're trying to scale up and you've got cash flow and you don't want to put a sweat. You're like, hey, you know what? I'm past this point. I don't want to do this. And then it's like, when you don't have it, it's like, all right, get 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 your content level up, you know. And yeah. and you can do it too. Like we've had clients do it. They're like, hey, I don't have any money. I'm like, all right, cool. You need to be posting, you know, three times a day on Instagram, three times a day on Facebook, three times a day on you know YouTube. You need to be sharing this. You need to be going into groups, you know, sharing things in groups, helping people with this, helping people with that. And you can do it. It's just a lot more work, but there's guys that you'll see people have really good organic content, you know, and it can, it can be done, but it's fun when you get to the point of obviously with, with doing ads, it just takes a little bit of work off your plate, but in the beginning, and it's fun too, though, when you're at that phase, cause you're in it, you're in the trenches and you're digging and you're, you're making content and you're seeing what converts and then you're running stories and you're putting call to actions and stories. People are messaging and you're like, okay, this works. It just takes time. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I've seen people use organic to test out what would be more effective in ads, whatever oh, yeah. got responded to in, in organic, they just throw it in an ad and then it performs better. So hundred percent. There you go. Well, awesome. What are the, actually any more dreams and goals you want to chat about before we move on? You got help people create income where they can control their life. You got the travel plus the cool events, the mastermind, any other dreams and goals you want to talk about? Man, that, that's it right now. I just want to travel a bunch and just, you know, keep enjoying life, enjoying the journey. There we go. There we go. I'll add that one in there. Enjoy the journey. Have you um talk to us a little bit about mindset? Because that enjoy the journey, I feel like is key as an entrepreneur. And I feel like it is very easy to get caught up on, oh, I don't have enough revenue. Oh, I don't have enough sales coming in. Oh, I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have this. And then that will just kill you. So talk to us about oh, that. Yeah. Mindset's huge as an entrepreneur. You got to deal with it every day. I mean, it's like you said, there's days where you're like, oh, I'm invincible. Everything's great. And you're like, oh my God, everything sucks. Mm -hmm. You know, you have those days. So you have to deal with the, that mindset of like, you know, all right, yes, this is hard. Yes, this is a challenge. This, but this, if it's what I want to do, I'm going to put in the work. But one thing that I see all the time with clients, and I'm guilty of it too, when I was younger, is not enjoying the journey because you're just like, you want to get the next destination. I want to get here. I got to get this. When we get the business to this level. Then we're going to go to this and this, this, this. And then you get there and you just, like, you're like, okay, now I got to set another destination. I didn't, you didn't really take time to like the old saying, like take time, smell the roses, enjoy the trip. It's like, you know, it got crazy. With my, like when I said, my best friend, when he wanted to get in the UFC, he got in the UFC and was fighting and doing all stuff. And I was traveling with him and doing that. And I, I really regret like, not like enjoying it more. Like we were like all business, like, okay, we get this done. Then we'll go to the fight and do the fight. And then it's like, okay, cool. We'll leave. And it was like, could have had so much more fun and enjoyed things and just, you know, enjoyed the journey a lot more instead of bouncing from, you know, thing to thing. It was so meticulous and methodical that i was like man we really should have enjoyed it a little bit more because when it's over you're like oh that sucks <laughs> yeah yeah no absolutely love it well awesome paul what are the top one to two skills that you need to develop right now in order to make these dreams 
come true? For me, it's just, you know, I feel good with the skills I've been developing those, you know, over the years and everything like that. Now it's just applying the skills to buy into more, um, more, more businesses be like, you know, I like to buy into a business like a silent partner where I don't have to deal with all the drama. And then you're just investing in that. So that's the biggest skill for me is, is learning how to do more private equity deals and getting around people that are really good at that. I see. I see. Okay. So you're buying into deals as a silent partner and do you also function as a mentor? Do you just have equity and you don't have any involvement? It's more passive. Yeah. Those are more passive because those guys are usually, they're usually a big uh, syndicate. So, you know, you don't get, I see. Yeah. They, they don't want any of your feedback. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> like, leave I me alone. You. you know, and, and I, the first time I did one of those deals, I understood. Cause it's like, like, man, if we have 200 investors and everybody's sending an email every day, you know, that's 200 emails a day with the same question. They're like, don't ask questions. It's like, okay, yeah. this is strange. <laughs> you understand it. You're like, oh, okay, this makes sense. You know? And so it's like learning how to play at that level is, is the next skill set. I gotcha. I gotcha. And so would you be the one giving money to the private equity and then they go out and do all the deal analysis, buying the deal, operating the deal? Yep. I gotcha. It's a lot like real estate syndication. Yeah. Yeah. So the good, the ultimate goal is just to be, you know, not having to deal with it. And then just, you know, it just keeps growing and creates that machine. Do you know what the typical returns are on a private equity deal? Like a good one? Yeah. I'm in my, the first one that we did, we had been zero right now. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. It's like I'm learning the, the process. You know, people will say, Oh, you know, it's, it's 20, 25%. And I'm like, well, that'd be great. You know, I'll, I'll take that all day long. Cause the stock market, you know, is up and down and, and round and round, but I'm learning the hard way that, you know, when we did the first, the runway is super long. Like it takes forever for these things to go through. And then you throw in the supply chain shortages and the post pandemic world we're living in, everything's getting pushed so far back. So I'm learning patience. <laughs> Yeah. a lot of patience and try to explain to my wife, like, no, I don't just wire money out and never get anything back. But yeah, it's definitely a process to learn. I gotcha. I gotcha. And what are the highest daily impact, highest impact daily actions that you can be doing right now to learn more about the private equity space, get into it, network in it. Networking. That, that was the biggest the networking is, is finding the cert, the people that are doing it, getting around them, going to their events, you know, network with them, interacting with them on social media. You know, one thing that is a good tip that I got from somebody is, you know, especially when you're dealing with somebody that's way above where you're at, somebody where you want to get to is don't ask them a lot of questions. They don't want to answer your questions. They're busy. They're doing stuff, but interact in their life. Like they're sharing stuff on Instagram, like their kids or their, their new car or their new plane. And it's like, I'll be like, oh man, that's so cool. Congratulations. Or, oh, hey, congratulations on the, on the new restaurant or, oh, hey, that's awesome. You know, your kid is, you know, when this golf tournament. So you become to the point. So when you do bump into them at the events that you start going to, they they kind of put a name like, oh hey, I, I know you. And then it's like, and then eventually you do if they do send something like you know you'll see like they have like a thing like hey we're raising money for this blah blah. blah. And you put hey I'm interested. What they'll do is they'll look at your messages on you know so like maybe they have the history on Instagram. It's like I'm not one of those guys that's like asking a million questions like hey can I pick your brain hey what do you think about this they look at it and they're like oh hey this guy has been like supporting what we've been doing for like a year. Yeah, you know, so because I get that all the time, like people like they'll be like, "Hey, can I pick your brain? Can I buy you coffee?" And I'm like, and I look at our our history on Instagram. I'm like, you've never commented on, you've never interacted on anything in my entire life, and now you want to pick my brain? It's yeah. like, no, it sounds painful. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think that is such a good point. For the longest time, I was longest time. I'm 23, so it couldn't yeah. have been that long. <laughs> but I was thinking about networking in the real estate space. And I was like, how do you add value to people? And a lot of times it's just being human. Yeah. And when you be human with somebody, there's a emotional connection that can be built. And that is an extreme amount of value. Like a lot of value is built on trust. And then obviously have the vehicle of value, like either have the money, have the skill set, or have the business to be able to exchange that value add, but building goodwill with people can go a long way. Yeah. And you nailed it there. Just be human. It, it, we've all gotten those messages on Instagram or Facebook where it's like, hi, could I have five minutes of your time to evaluate your marketing plan? I'm like, no, I didn't ask you for, I don't, you know, it's like yeah. be human, you know, it's like, cause yeah, if, if, if somebody is a, a good person that I know, I'm like, oh, you know, I've, like I've done deals with people that I've never met in person, you know, you just, on social media, but you develop friendships. Like some of my closest friends, I don't see them, you know, but maybe a couple of times once a year, once every other year, but we, we're still friends because we, you know, we've met in person, but we interact on social media all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like you develop this network because that's the hardest thing for entrepreneurs that are listening is like getting around people that are in the situation you're in or at the next level you want to get to is a lot of times you have to go outside of your network, go outside of your town, except, you know, you're in Austin. So like everybody's there. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like a melting pot. 
but like for me it's like i can't talk to my friends about the things i want to do because then they're like well that doesn't make any i'm like all right okay not fun talking to you i'm gonna talk to the guys that are actually doing it because yep. you know nobody wants to see you do better than them so they'll find ways to talk you out of doing stuff or talk down the ideas so it's like i'm always trying to expand my network you know through social media and then it's like you develop some really good friendships yeah absolutely that's uh like crabs in the bucket is what crabs you're in the bucket yeah. yeah and it's true it's like even family it's like uh, why are you doing this the worst now? ones <laughs> Like, oh, you think you're Tony Robbins now? It's like, no, I'm just talking about stuff. It's like, oh. what? and maybe I do think I'm Tony, you know, it's like, what would, what would be the worst thing if your kid became the next Tony Robbins? They're probably going to buy you a bunch of really cool stuff when you're old. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's so funny. Do you know who Brad Lee is? Oh, I love Brad Lee. One yeah. of my favorites. <laughs> He's a beast. Um, he was talking about this on his Instagram. And he was like, what? Do you want me to think less of myself? Is yeah. that what you want? <laughs> Like, I'm not worthy of this. Okay, thanks, mom. <laughs> thanks, yeah, uncle, thanks, Uncle Tom, Uncle Steve, Uncle Joe. You know. Exactly. Well, awesome, Paul. If there were one or two people that you could meet right now, and this could be a specific person or a type of person, and they'd really help you take the next step towards your dreams and goals, who would they be, and how would they do it? Who would they be? Man, that's a that's a tough one. Um, because I've met a lot, in, like in the circle I'm in, I've met a lot of people that I want to be doing stuff with down the road. You know, the one person I would love to meet and sit down and, and talk to is Warren Buffett. Mm-hmm. You know, he's the legend. He's he's the he's the he's the I mean, he's he's the man. It's like sitting down and talking to him, you know, and having a, a, a not pick up like having just a conversation, you know, talking to him. It's like because you get so much value out of like watching what the guy's done. For me, he's a legend because like the, everybody tries to clown the guy. It's like in you know, in 2001, he was an idiot because he wasn't invested in the internet. And then, you know, when all the crypto stuff was going down, they're like, oh, this guy's too old. He doesn't understand what's happening. And it's like, you know, everybody goes up and down and Warren just does this, just yeah. smooth, <laughs> multi-billion dollars. It's like, people are like, he makes more money in dividends from Coca-Cola than the CEO of Coca-Cola makes. I mean, yep. it's, <laughs> it, it's absolutely insane. Like, and, you know, and the thing that, and it'd be cool to meet him because like, he's a massive consumer of knowledge. Like they say, he reads all day long like people are like well doesn't he do a lot of things and it'd be cool to hear like he him tell you about what he does and how he does it yeah i think i was listening to eric thomas and maybe it wasn't eric thomas maybe it was somebody else but they were talking about warren buffett's schedule compared to their schedule and their schedule was like booked 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 and warren buffett's was like one thing every two months (laughs) and that's it he just reads makes a couple of high impact decisions that makes him billions of dollars per year and then yeah like we're all freaked out like oh what stock should i buy now and he's like well you buy a stock with the plan of never selling it you know and everybody else is like what crypto coin he's like i don't even know what crypto is he's like i buy what i understand you know he buys coca-cola and uh burlington northern you know all this it's just crazy he gets rich off the most boring stuff yep just keeps it so simple simple yeah it's crazy i love it i love it well awesome now we're gonna jump into our thriving three and our first question is what's your favorite book movie or podcast pick one Man, uh, book is the compound effect. Mm. Uh, I love it. I read it every year just as a reminder because, you know, compound interests, like Einstein says, the eighth one of the world, but the compound effect is like, you just start stacking little habits. You know, another book is Atomic Habits, which yep. is, it's, if you stack those two books together, it'll change your life because you realize like, we always think, especially if you're trying to get to that next thing, like I got to do all these things. And yeah, and it's like, no, 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 you don't have to do the big things. It's like, do a bunch of little things every day and then they start stacking and stacking and stacking so i love the compound effect i i have it in print audible and uh kindle <laughs> so it's like i try to you know if i'm bored on a flight i'll listen to it you know yeah just, just a reminder because you always pick up a little nugget like oh yeah i gotta remember that yeah i love the uh i actually love the audio version of that book yeah because his voice brings it to life yeah it's it's so good yeah awesome and what is one way you like to take care of yourself one way i like to take care of myself uh saunas <laughs> i'm scandinavian my family's uh, scandinavian so it's always been a thing and it's like you know if i'm stressed out or i'm you know got something on my mind or you know it's like i love jujitsu that's that's my life but it's like to to take care of myself it's like hey, you know what i need to go sauna you know because clear your mind you know sweat out all the junk in life and just kind of reset so yeah, and there's yeah. tons of like tons of uh, if you follow like dr Rhonda patrick and stuff like that tell people talk about like longevity and stuff there's just so many benefits to it so i'm like might as well do it yeah yeah for sure how long do you typically sauna for uh the goal is 20 to 30 minutes in a session gotcha i feel that and do you do it like once a week twice a week whenever you uh, can. aim for three to four nice yeah because nice. they did that study i can't remember the exact number but if you 
if you did, they did a study. I was like, if you did like 30 minutes, three times a week, it cut down like coronary deaths by like 40%. And if you did it four times a week, it was over like, like 60%. It's like, it's crazy. And I've seen crazy effects because there was a time when I was super stressed out and, you know, not, and not eating the best and, and working a whole bunch on stuff. And my start, my blood pressure got real high and I'm like, what the heck, what's going on? I'm an active person. It's like, I don't get this. Yeah. But then, like, and you start realizing like I've been doing jujitsu for so long. It's not as cardio taxing. So you can find ways to like not work as hard and kind of stall and, and control a position where it's like, man, I'm not getting enough cardiovascular, like hard, hard work. And so I started doing the sauna after listening to that one and like literally, you know, blood pressure is fine. It's, it's so crazy. Like, so it works. It's, it's crazy. There you go. Yeah. Saunas. Saunas. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is one action step you can take right now to meet Warren Buffett and have that conversation? <clears throat> Man, the, the action step to meet Warren Buffett. The first step would be to go to the annual shareholder meeting, which I keep saying I'm going to do. Like I have um, shares of the B class of Berkshire and you can go, but I never do it. You know, so it's one of those things I just need to get off my butt and go. Well, obviously the last couple of years you couldn't go. Um, but I've had friends do it and they say it's crazy because, he, you know, if you can get in, you know, you can actually see Warren and Charlie Munger talking and they're giving their presentation. And so it's kind of, I think that's the first step, you know, obviously social media is not going to work. I don't think that guy is ever is on anything. So yeah. you have to go old school, you know, but it, it would be cool to see him talk. You know, it's like one of my, when I was growing up, like Michael Jordan was like my, my hero. I always wanted to go to a game, never got to see it. And then one time he came to Dallas with the wizards and I was kind of like, oh, I should go to that game. And I'm like, ah, oh, the wizards suck. And Jordan's kind of old. And I'm like, yeah, I don't need to see it. And then I'm like, when he retired, I'm like, I never saw him play. You know, I never yeah. saw it with my own two eyes. You know, I saw, saw Kobe, I saw Shaq, you know, guys like that, but it's like, I never saw Jordan. And I'm like, I'm an idiot. I had a chance and I didn't do it. So I need to get off my butt and go to the shareholder meeting at, in Lincoln, Nebraska. I got you. I got you. There you go. Well, now we got our final series of questions and these can get, these can get a little bit personal. Okay. So if you don't want to answer them, just be like, I'm a pass and we'll go to the next one. Okay. What is one limiting belief that continues to pop up in your life? If any. Limiting belief that pops up. Man. If any, I mean, you seem like a guy who's kind of taking care of that. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't have any, I mean, not to sound like Eric, but it's like, I don't have a limiting belief because I battle that every day with like journaling and, and like, Hey, you know what, we're going to accomplish this one. So I think, you know, work on your mindset. You, you shouldn't have any, you know, cause you can do anything. I mean, we're seeing guys do crazy stuff. We're seeing Elon do crazy stuff. We're seeing regular people do crazy stuff, you know, watching Brad Lee blow up. Like I remember I saw him at the first 10 X and it was like, he was just like a regular dude. Now you're like, he's like super famous. It's, it's crazy. And that was like four years ago. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I am such a fan of not having any limiting beliefs. And since you've kind of gotten to the point where you have become so adept at battling them that they don't hinder you in your daily life, talk to us about that journaling process and the mindset work that you do to get to that point. Man, it goes, you got to work on your mindsets. I listen to uh, inspiring podcasts, read books, um, you know, journal. Like the biggest thing I tell people is like when you're journaling, it goes back to another Warren Buffett one is like, it was when one of his, uh, I forget what he talk, was talking about, but it's like when you get, feel overwhelmed and you got like, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. I got too much things going on. Take out a sheet of paper, write down everything you're thinking about, take a little break, come back to the sheet of paper and then circle the the three things you can that you need to get done and just write those down and throw the rest of the paper away. Get your focus because yeah. we, we stress out about things that, you know, we start, we only have so much bandwidth and we take on too many things. Our our first instinct is like, Oh my God, don't do anything. <laughs> it's like, stop, you know, think. So if you can give yourself like, Hey, you know what? I just need to get these three things done this week. And this is going to be a good week and we're going to win. So that, that to me, makes a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. I like the focus aspect of it because focus is like probably one of our most prized commodities, especially in today's times where it's like, dude, I'll like, I'll pick up my phone just mindlessly and yeah. it'll break focus. Like so easy. Not- it is so easy. And yeah. And I have friends that like, it freaks me out when I hear a notification. Cause I don't have any notifications turned on. There's no way I'd have, but like, I'll be around with people and they're like, it's like ding, ding, ding. And I'm like, Oh God, what stop. You know, it's <laughs> like, why do you have that turned on? And they're like, well, I, I might miss something. I'm like, so it's like, and, and a lot of times not to knock people, but they're, these are also the people that aren't that vested in like personal development or like getting that next level. They're just like, they just want to be entertained. Like, Oh, Hey, do you see this tweet? I'm like, I really don't care. It's like, I've got stuff I got to get done. Maybe I want to do it on my time where it's like, you know, I, I put blocks where it's like, you know, 
you get your stuff done. Okay, cool. Yeah. 30 minutes of mindless scrolling. What did I miss on, you know, Facebook or Instagram? Oh, okay. Didn't miss much of anything or maybe one <laughs> thing, but, but I want to control it on my terms, not like having my phone go off and be like, Hey, look at me, you know? So that's another thing is not having notifications turned on was a game changer. Like I don't even have text notifications turned on. My wife will get mad. She's like, I'm texting you. I'm like, Oh, sorry. It's like my phone, my phone's off, you know, it's, it's there, but I don't hear it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever read that book deep work by Cal Newport? Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Great book. Great book. And it talks a lot about digital minimalism in that book, but then he has a whole nother book dedicated to digital minimalism. And um, yeah, just so important to have those notifications turned off. Did you ever have a time where you were more addicted to your phone and it was kind of hard to kick that habit? Or were you just kind of like, since they started coming out, I'm not going to let them distract me. Man, no, I, I'm just like everybody else. I'm, I had my weaknesses where it's like, and it got, it was a running joke at my, when I was, cause I was like, so into like growing the business and growing the gym that I would be like, have my phone and you know, you're, you're looking at it and somebody says something and you didn't hear what they'd say. So I would always be like, oh, that's crazy. You know? And then like, it got to the point where my friends started making fun of me and they're like, that's crazy. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, yeah, when you're ignoring, and I'm like, I'm like, it's that bad. Then I asked my wife, she's like, yeah, you're really bad about that. And I was like, okay, this is, I, I got to stop. This is bad. It's like, people are talking to me. I'm ignoring them because I'm like, oh, I got to get this done. I got to get this done and don't make sure I don't miss this and this and this. And it was all in my head was like, well, I'm trying to grow and I'm trying to elevate the business, you know? And it was, but it was like, man, you, you don't need to have the phone control. You, you need to control the phone. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. When you said that, it kind of reminded me of um, always being busy and productive versus being effective. And so can you talk to us a little bit about that? You mentioned Warren Buffett writing down the th writing down everything and then picking the top three. What criteria do you use to pick the top three and what criteria do you suggest people use to pick the top three? I, I look at the top three of like what what's going to move the business or my life forward. You know, what what is the most important thing that needs to get done? So, you know, if it's something like, hey, We've got, you know, I've got all these, like everybody's probably listeners has 15 things they need, feel like they got to do today. Like, oh my God, I got to do this. I got to do that or that. And it's like, okay, you look at the sheet of paper, it's circled. Then one of them is like, you know, make sure the copy's ready to launch um, the new offer. And it's like, well, that's pretty important because we can't launch the offer if it sucks. Yeah. So it's like, that's more important than, you know, me updating something to my accountant or sending in uh, a tech, uh, sending in something to, you know, my bookkeeper. It's like, oh, I can do that later. This has to get done. I need to block this out. So and it's something I've been going through because we we're relaunching a new course and doing all this stuff. And I'm, I'd get like, okay, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. And I'm like, okay, no, this is going to move things forward the most. So it's like yeah. having that. So when I do that, because when you start stacking like the habits, so like, like we're talking about earlier with the compound effect, like I've got become a really good at scheduling things. Like I live my life through my Google calendar and that includes family. Like the first thing I, I put on my Google calendar is, you know, what are, what's date night, what's family night, you know, that those are priority. Those, those are, those are non-negotiable because you can find time to do the other things. You know, it's, it's like, yep. but I have a lot of friends, they, they don't do that. And they're like, Oh, you know, I don't get this done. And they're neglecting things. I'm like, man, it's like, you know, for me, it's like, Wednesday night is shut down. I don't do anything. It's just family. We do that. And then Friday night, we have like a date night where we go out. And then, you know, then I'm like, okay, so if I need to get all my stuff done, so like, I know like today was Friday was a busy day. Cause I have, I had to do recordings this morning uh, for some of our content and then this podcast. And then I've got another thing I got to do. So I was like, you know what? I got to get up an hour earlier and I got to knock out all the mind. I call it mindless work. You know, the stuff you can do when you're half asleep mm -hmm. because people will, people will, let's think that's the important stuff. It's like, no, that's mindless. You know, like another guy follows Craig Ballantyne. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's really good about organizing things. It's like, like he calls it non, non-intentional something like that. But it's like, I call it like, like if it's something I can do half awake and it's not going to affect things and I can mark it off my list. I'm like, that's cool. So I'll get up early, you know, get out the computer. Everybody's asleep. No one's up, just me. And I'm just like, okay, what is the mindless things? Look at my calendar. Like, okay, if I can get these things done, it's off my plate. It's off my mental bandwidth. And I can move into the important stuff. And then it was like, okay, I get this done. Then I know when I got to do content, or I got to do a podcast. I have to be, you know, focused on that, have my phone and my computer and do not disturb mode, you know, I'll tell my wife's like, Hey, I'm, I'm blocked out from nine to 11, you know, nothing there, but she's like, Oh, cool. I'm going to go run errands. You know, we'll have date night and we'll go to the gym tonight. And then we'll go out and have sushi. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm gonna get my stuff done. And it helps a lot. If you communicate with your spouse or your significant other too, of like what you're doing and why, and then you always tell them because they always feel neglect a lot of times. So like, let them know like, Hey, no, the most important thing in my life is, you know, Wednesday dinner with the family and then Friday going to the gym with the family and, and having, you know, dinner. And then maybe on Saturday or Sunday, we do, 
watch the Cowboys lose or whatever. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but you let them know, you let them know that they're the priority. And then they'll like the other 80% of the week, they don't care if you're doing your thing for work because they expect you to be working. But it's when, when I was younger and I was really grinding, I'd always be, you know, I wasn't making that as clear. I was like, no, I got to get this done. I got to get this done. And it was, it was kind of a thing where I, you know, looking back, I'm like, yeah, I could have done that a little better, you know, had a little less few arguments over, you know, pointless things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, awesome. We got one last question for you. You know who Alex Hormozzi is? Oh yeah. Gotcha. Um, I watched a video and he said that the difference between manipulation and help is intent. And I think his point here is that you're influencing people in both situations, but manipulation is about getting somebody to do something that you want them to do, while help is about seeking first to understand what somebody else wants and then helping them get there. This question is going to be about help, not manipulation. Like it. So there's a common saying that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. I actually found out from Dr. Alan Laika, who was a guest on my show, that you can make it drink. You just have to salt its oats. Now... <laughs> I want you to think of a person with a really fixed mindset, not willing to accept help, not willing to accept change. They hate their life. How can we, you and I, go about creating an environment to salt their oats and help them change their life? Man, that's a great question. Yeah, I love all Hermosi's content. It's so good. And and it goes back to, to when I first started out in the corporate world, like I was like, I'm never going to sell anything. I don't want to sell. You know, I don't want to manipulate and be this sleazy salesperson. And I, I forget who it was said. They're like, well, don't be a sleazy salesperson, help people. It's like, if you help them, sales is easy. So when I teach people sales, I'm like, we just have to help people. So what I do, if I get like a client who's just like, man, you are just not a happy person. <laughs> it's like, you are, you know, and, and a lot of times it's like finding out like, you know, what makes them, what do they enjoy? Cause everybody's a little bit different. It's like, what do you enjoy? It's like, oh, okay, you enjoy that. We'll plan that out and, and do that and set that up. But as far as like helping them, a lot of it is like, it's tough. Cause you're trying to help them with their mindset, you know, trying to do little things. And a lot of times it's, ooh, that's tough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's because you're like, you know, helping them, like helping them with their business, helping with their finances is easy. Helping them with their life is a, is a tougher one. But I think if you go at it as like, Hey, you know what, what do you want? Like, what do you want out of life? You know, what is your, what is your thing? And then like, the, hopefully they tell you. And then if they tell you, it's like, all right, cool. How do you add more of that? Okay. You start scheduling it into your schedule. Okay. Well, they're like, well, I don't have time for that. Okay. Schedule five minutes a week. Oh yeah, I could do that then 10 minutes, then 20. And then once they start doing the things they enjoy, you know, then I feel like that is the way to make it, to make it where it's, you don't want to manipulate them. You know, you want them to feel like it was their idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. That was tough. <laughs> that oh, was tough yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. And I think when you ask them, Hey, what do you want? How can you add more of that? It is like, this is your idea. I'm just helping you. Yeah. Uh, get past your own objections for you living your best life. Like, yeah, literally, that's what it is. Oh, and um, it's funny. I get that from clients because they're like, because I'm a big fan as a stockbroker. So I'm a big fan of the stock market. I invest. They're like, I get people are like, I don't ever want to invest in the stock market. I'm like, cool, don't. And they're like, you're not going to argue with me. I'm like, why would I argue with you? you? You don't, you're scared of it. You don't like it. You don't understand it. Don't do it. You know, yeah. you can set up, we call it a financial freedom account. You set up like an account. It's basically a, like a high yield savings account. You know, it's like, it doesn't go down it just goes up it's not making you're not making a lot of money but you're at least you're you're investing you're creating money you're like hey and then they're like well i'm not going to do the stock market i'm like well what do you like and they're like oh I, I like rental property i want to do airbnbs i'm like well cool put money in this account when you have the money in this account then go buy one of those and they're like oh okay yeah yeah i'll do that so it's kind of funny that that question actually is one of the, it goes back to one of the things we do with people because it's like I don't ever want to force things on people like, no, no, you have to buy. Like when, you know, you, we all had the crazy ass friend that was like, you got to buy Bitcoin or you're, you're going to be poor. <laughs> you know? it's, like, <laughs> it's like, I don't have to do anything, but people were doing it, you know? And it's like, you know, if you don't understand it, you're not ready yet. You know, you don't have to you know, be manipulated into things. You have, you know, find things you want and things you understand and you like, and then invest in those. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Well, awesome. Paul, that's all we got for you, man. Is there anything else you want to chat about before we sign off? Man, no, that was fun. That was good. A lot of good questions. <laughs> yeah, it was a good time having you on. And I feel like I have become a better person through this podcast. So there we well, go. Thank you. I appreciate it. Of course. Well, Paul, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks and for having me. It was fun. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys for listening. If you liked what Paul had to say, you want to reach out to him, all the ways to contact him will be down in the show notes. If you want to go on one of his cool mastermind events, where <laughs> trips, training, fun times, and just growth, um, contact him, hit him up, social media, a website, what's best? 
Yes. Uh, social media. I love Instagram. It's my favorite. It's Instagram.com forward slash P-A-U-L period H-A-L-M-E. Only bad thing about Instagram is the stupid imposter. When you talk about investing, you get these fake accounts that tell people, hey, send me crypto, blah, blah. So it's in my bio. Like, I'll never ask you for crypto. It's like, so, so don't listen to that if you get any of those. Um, so just make sure you have this, the period H-A-L-M-E. And then my website, paulholme.com. I update blogs on there. Uh, of different things we're doing but yeah i love instagram just the, the aspect of like the stories and seeing behind the scenes of people's lives and, and just learning and stuff so that's my favorite spot yeah there we go well awesome all those links to hit up paul will be down in the show notes thank you guys for watching we will see you on the next one and on that note we're out